Google Search, Google Now, YouTube, Google Photos, Translate. What's common across all these products and actually many other products that you and I use today is that they're all powerful products solving everyday problems, but powered by information, right? And in many cases, AI and machine learning in various forms. I'm Aparna, Director of Product at Google. It is not my birthday today, sorry. Uh, but I have worked on information products across Google Search, YouTube, and most recently, Google Now. And I want to share with you today a few lessons and observations you know, from being in the trenches, seeing what worked, and often what didn't work in practice. And I hope you find it useful. Now, before I go on to do that, you know, some of you might rightly ask, well, you know, these products have been there for a few years, so why is it relevant now? And more importantly, why is it relevant for me as a person building a product or building a startup? I have one word for you, mobile. So on the input side, mobile changes the game in a fundamental way. If you think about it, there are three billion plus phones we all use in everyday life, billions of pictures taken, live streams on Periscope or other products, um, billions of videos watched, millions of places visited, an order of magnitude more information that's improving these products that you, you and I use, right? That's on the input side. But mobile changes the game on the output side as well. That is, you know, the phone is always with you, you're on the go, so people have access to your products in situations and contexts that they've never had before. You know, think about it. You're at home, in the car, uh, your kid's swimming class, or, you know, hold up in a giant dark conference room like this one, and you have access to information and apps uh, and services. So what does that mean? So if you combine these two things together, almost every other real-world problem has a chance to turn into a software and more importantly, an AI problem. And it's already happening, right? If you think about it, you know, entertainment options at home, it's a recommendation problem. Uh, transportation and dispatching cars through traffic, again, an information problem. Monitoring health and fitness, information problem. So as many of you are thinking about building products and building startups that solve real world problems, chances are you will have to figure out how to build information products and get it right. So you might as well start on it. So what is the formula to get it right? Yes, there is no simple formula in reality, right? But from my experience, what I've seen is that the best thoughtful product experiences come from a combination of AI, intelligence, UI, the interface to that intelligence, and finally, I, that is, how do you adapt the product you're building and personalize it to every person that's using it in different situations? So let's talk about AI, right? Um, there's a lot of excitement. I'm excited, too, about the possibilities and advances in AI, but it's really important to keep in mind uh, that you have to apply the technology in very, very careful ways, right? Uh, you know, as someone joked on Twitter, Last year, the startup pitch was Uber for X, and this year it's AI for X. Um, so here are a few observations from seeing what worked and what didn't in practice. First, when you're thinking of applying machine learning or AI, you want to throw these techniques at problems that are easy for machines and hard for people. So let me give you an example, right? If you're like me, I can barely speak one or two languages. So when there is an automatic translation uh, using Google Translate, for example, and I can automatically say a few things in like 100 plus languages, I'm delighted as a user, even if it's less than 100% accurate. Because guess what? My alternate option here is 0% accurate, right? Uh, you know, I may have to resort to sign language or something. Now, if you take a problem that's at the other end that is easy for humans but hard for machines, you know, sentence parsing or speech are at the other end. That is, most humans do um, hear what they speak, and we all have decent comprehension skills. 
So the bar for an AI system to be able to satisfy and delight users there is much higher. Now, don't get me wrong, we are making advances. You know, we just, uh, Google just open sourced uh, the best uh, sentence parsing tool uh, called Parsi McParseface. I just love saying that name. Um, and we, what we found is that it has 94% accuracy in terms of sentence parsing or uh, language understanding. And trained linguists have around 96 to 97% accuracy, right? So it's getting there. But it's really important to know, especially as people get excited about conversational interfaces and bots, to say, hey, uh, to, for the system to reach that reliability that, human, that people are satisfied with, it's a higher bar. So the low-hanging fruit when you're thinking about your product and applying AI is easy for machines, hard for people. Second observation, all information products have what uh, we call as win to loss ratio, or what I call as wow to what the hell ratio. Uh, let me unpack that a little bit. Right. Um, you're searching for news, let's say, about uh, One Direction. right? And then Google returns a slightly re less relevant article. It doesn't return the article that's talking about how Zayn Malik is really doing well and you know, the band is really unhappy. Not that I would know much about this, but um, it's a less relevant article, it is a loss, but not a big deal, right, in the big scheme of things. But let's say you're using an assistant product. It told you to get in the car, drive to the airport, show up at a gate, it's the wrong gate, you miss the flight, and you miss the conference talk. And you're like, what the hell? So for that product to regain the trust and be used by users, you will need a lot more wows to make up for that what the hell moment. So all information products have this inherent win to loss ratio uh, because you have imperfect systems. So you want to be very careful about thinking about how do you make up for those inevitable, annoying what the hell moments. And the cost of getting it wrong is different for different domains. The final thing I want to say about the AI element is that a lot of the machine learning systems the training shapes the learning. That is, the input data that the system has influences the behavior and the patterns that the system learns. To give you an example, you know, Google Photos is great, uh, but if the training data doesn't have a variety of you know, pictures to learn from, sometimes it makes mistakes. Right? This one, in this case, it thinks that the cat picture, the first picture, is lunch food because it has roughly the same shapes and so on, same shapes and colors. Uh, to give you an example closer to me, uh, around 2012 or 2013, I was very bearish on speech recognition. Right? Um, it could never understand my accent. It could never pick up my long last name. And part of the thing is the training data. Right? But over time, the training that once the training data expands to, say, a variety of accents, a variety of you know, dialects and age groups, the speech recognition system got that much better. So that's about AI, right? But equally important the, as intelligence powering, this is powering your product is the interface to the product. And I want to share a few observations here about what, how to think about it right. The first lesson here was that the UI needs to be proportionate to the confidence in AI. What do I mean by that? I'll give you a very simple, subtle example here. Right? If you misspell something in Google search, right, here, right, in the six Obama, right? If the system is very confident that you're very likely to have misspelled it, after all, this word is not a real thing, it goes ahead and replaces that search term and gives you the answer for the thing that you're likely to have typed, right, Barack Obama. That's a high confident UI. Now, if you typed instead something like you know, Zootopia, but you spelled it with Z-U versus the double O, the confidence in the system is lower because you could have meant the movie or the bookshop in London, for example. And in this case, it has a lower confidence UI. That is, hey, just merely suggest, did you mean this? This is a very subtle example, but you can think of other ways where as the underlying system gets complex, and handles all the complexity and handles all the and inherent intelligence under the hood, 
you can afford on the UI side to be far more simple and sure shot. Second lesson we learn, uh, this is particularly in Google Now that we learn, which is there's obviously some beauty to magic and prediction, but there's always a trade-off between predictability and magic, right? There are some products where you really don't care how it works. You don't actually need to be explained how the system works. You know, if you're trying to win a game, who cares? Just make sure that the right recommendation shows up and the right moves show up and you're done. But in certain other products and certain other features, for example, in Google Now, what we found is that when, you're, when people are thinking about everyday logistics, right? Uh, you know, how do I get to the next meeting or how do I find directions to the uh, place that I go to? People want more predictability and determinism in how they operate, right? They have a place where they look for things, and sometimes, even if it takes longer, they have a comfort and trust in going that route versus a magic that is sometimes unpredictable, right? The extreme example is we actually prototyped internally something where uh, we would redraw the app icons on the home screen based on what you're likely to use at any given time it drove people nuts, right? Like imagine re rearranging the grid of apps all the time on the home screen because what we found is that people have muscle memory, right? They'd rather like scroll through three screens and find that specific icon than look around and see where, where it jumped around, even though it was faster 90% of the time. So predictability versus magic is a trade-off that you want to consider. The other point that we found is that any information product, this is true for across the board, right? User feedback loops are what drives the systems, right? What, drive, what makes your product better is getting some feedback on how users are seeing the results and improving it over time. Um, so example, you know, YouTube recommended a video. Did you click through and watch it to the end? That's a good feedback loop. Or you search for birthday pictures in Google Photos. Did you scroll through a bunch of pictures, right? But it gets really tricky with these emerging interfaces, right? Let's say you have a chat-based interface and, you know, or a voice-based interface. I said, OK, Google, will it rain this weekend? And turns out it will. And so I made alternate plans. All's well with me. So I found it useful. But the system, but the product, has no way of finding out that I did, right? Uh, to give another example with Google Now, often people found just the notification at a glance to be pretty useful, right? Traffic, your, your, your commute is going to be 30 minutes longer. There is no feedback loop there because the users are not interacting in a very heavyweight way. So as you see new and um, emerging lightweight interfaces to your products, you'll have to make sure that you get user feedback in other ways. Right. What we found in our own product building is that there are other ways. For example, you can have qualitative feedback. Right? You can ask users. Uh, you can have user studies. And sometimes you can even sample one person of your users. You ask them, hey, did you find this useful? Right? Um, those are some crutches, but it's important to recognize that user feedback is critical but hard. So you talk, we talked about intelligence. We talked about the interface. But the final ingredient it's really important to think about is how do you adapt the product you're building to each person and each situation, right? A few observations here. One of the things we found is that you want to make sure that as soon as people are starting to use the product, the benefits are clear and immediate, right? Uh, people don't use products where they say you come on board and trust us, someday, somewhere, something will get better, right? So to give, me, to give you an example, I use Waze. As soon as I start using the product, based on my location, it tells me, hey, here are the tra you know, faster traffic routes, or it alerts me about traffic jams nearby and so on. So that feedback loop, again, that there's a tangible connection between me using the product and it using my location to a very clear benefit. Second thing here, and this is, you know, being Google and you know, a bunch of like, smart engineers, for the longest time, our default assumption was, hey, technology needs to do all the heavy lifting, so we'll learn everything possible. We'll do all the heavy lifting. But then we asked ourselves, wait a minute. Sometimes you can just ask users, right? I know, genius. Um, but when we started doing that in, across our products, we started fi finding that it's a really nice complement 
to an implicit learning that happens in products, right? Now, you want to be careful and thoughtful. You don't want users to fill out a tax form without, again, seeing that immediate benefit. But it's really useful to say, hey, here are the you know, people that we think are in the pictures. Could you confirm it for us? Or in this feature, a smart reply in inbox, you can offer the default suggestions. You can still have the tech doing the heavy lifting and say, for this email, we think these are the three or four responses you might want to have. Can you confirm? Right? And as the user does that, again, the system can b get better over time. So explicit inputs from users is pretty key and shouldn't be ignored. The final point I want to make here is that putting the eye in the picture or adapting products and personalizing products is also about figuring out who are your users. And I want to share an anecdote. It's a bit humbling uh, and kind of a reality check for us. But there was this feature that a few engineers in the team got really excited, right? Uh, we all uh, were in the Bay Area. We all have like parking woes. And an engineer was like, hey, we should just let the phone remember where you parked your car. We thought it's an awesome idea, so we built that feature. Uh, everyone loved it with internally as we were testing the feature. In the course of time, we had a user study that we did in Mumbai in India. So the engineer was really excited about this feature. He went on and on about how this can be super useful for users. And the guy we were talking to, doing the user study with, he kind of almost fell off the chair. And he said, wait, so let me get this straight. I take a train every morning in Mumbai, and I actually jump off a moving train every morning. So this tool, this feature, so it's going to remind me exactly when I jump off, where I jump off the train. How is this useful? It's a tiny example, but we were completely off in terms of figuring out, well, what are the transportation behaviors and needs of people in this market, and why should they care? Right? Um, again, there are many more examples where it's a good reminder that all of the smarts, all of this interface logic that we're thinking about mean nothing if you're not targeting to the users, the specific set of users that you are trying to reach. Now, it's one thing if you said, hey, this feature is only for you know, sub semi-urban, suburban cities in the US. It should, be, it should make perfect sense here. Now, like I said, it's overly simplistic to reduce all of the product thinking. No self-respecting product process wants to be reduced to a formula. But mobile plus AI do open up a lot of opportunities for many, many real-world problems to be treated and seen and solved as information problems. But for you to tap into it, you do want to make sure that you're applying AI and machine learning, not arbitrarily, but pretty smartly and thoughtfully, and getting the most bang for the buck. You do want to make sure that the interfaces that you're building are resilient and reliable, right? Because the underlying system isn't. And finally, you do want to make sure that you're putting all of this effort toward adapting your product to the people that you care most about, the, your customers, your target users in the market that you're going after. Now, I hope you found these observations helpful. Uh, these are really early days, and I think it's very exciting to see how, what kind of opportunities uh, open up, and we'll learn more as we go. Uh, this is my Twitter handle. I'd love to get questions and thoughts uh, and get the discussion going. Thank you.